Praise the Lord. We'll rise up and spend time in prayer. You commit yourself to the Lord. That today the Bible study will be beneficial to your heart. That everything you hear, God will give you the grace and the spiritual strength to be able to carry everything out and to do what the Lord is teaching us so that our coming to the Bible study will not just be something theoretical, something we do every time with no results. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord. These are practical studies. Pray that the Lord himself or grant you the heart to be obedient to these practical, wonderful teachings of Christ so that the grace of God will so reveal itself, manifest itself in your life and your neighbors, members of your family, your acquaintances, everyone that has any contact with you, relating with you, will know that you have been in the presence of the Lord. Pray that your obedience will be so visible, noticeable, that people will see, people will know, they'll see. What's coming to the presence of the Lord has done in your life. Grace multiplied. Spiritual energy. Dynamic. Fruitful. Yielding fruit in your life. Well, see and behold. So that through your life, others will come to know the Lord. So that through your life, believers will be edified and encouraged. And the church will grow. Pray for others who are the Bible study to in this location and all, all the other locations that are coming together in all those locations were very fruitful that the impact of this word will be seen nationwide and the influence the power of the word will so work in our lives to show in our families and show everywhere in this continent of Africa and beyond so they all know we are people of the word in Jesus name we pray you can do better than that. Yeah. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you very much for this time. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the love that you are teaching us. Lord, these are practical lessons, practical teachings that you call us to carry out every day and every way in our relationship with our neighbors, in our relationship with our friends, in our relationship with believers and members of the church, in our relationship with even enemies that set themselves in opposition to us, we pray, oh Lord, your grace will be so much abundant in every one of our lives that this word will take preeminence over every other feeling in our hearts and our lives in Jesus' name. And we pray, oh Lord, that as you teach us these words, that these words will prepare us for our home in glory. That when that day will come, that we we'll leave this world, the assurance that we have learned your word, and the assurance we have prayed, 
and your grace has been multiplied in our lives to so be obedient to your word. Oh Lord, we pray your grant unto every one of us in Jesus' name. Once again, as we open the pages of the scriptures today, keep us awake that you will not sleep while you are speaking to us. And then that your word will energize us to go back home, go back to the places we came from, and do exactly as you teach us. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You can see now. We'll come back to Matthew chapter 5. These are the words of the Lord. It's almost like we should stay a long time just listening to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 5, the Lord had been talking about the life of the believer, the life of the citizen of the kingdom. And actually, as you look at these words, you are able to tell whether you are in the kingdom or not. You see, brothers and sisters, the kingdom life is a spiritual scene. Coming into the kingdom is a spiritual thing. And there are many people that profess that they are in the kingdom. How do you know whether the profession is right or wrong? How do you know whether the a profession is factual or false? By looking at the word of God and then looking at their lives. And then comparing the word of God, the teaching of the word, or the lives that the people live. Here the Lord Jesus said, the kingdom is at hand. And the people that are coming to hear the word of God, they press into the kingdom. They enter into the kingdom. But you don't know anybody who has entered. You don't know when they entered. You don't know how they prayed. You don't know what change took place in their lives. It's as they come out, they interact with you. They live with you. And they speak to you and you speak to them. And you rub minds together and you even rub shoulders together. And then you see their manner of life, you see their disposition, you see their behavior. That's how you know truly this one is life matches. The teaching of Christ concerning the life of the kingdom. He has been into the kingdom. But if his life is contrary to what you read in the word of God, you say, wait a minute. He makes a lot of profession and he shouts a lot in his testimony and is the very first person to say i know the lord i know the lord but from what we read in the words of jesus christ and he says this is the description the painting of the picture of the life of the kingdom citizen you see this one is different and let god be true though every man be a liar and so as you compare the word of God, then you are able to tell this belongs to God. For an individual, for a family, the same thing. Because you know, husbands and wives and children are almost, always, almost all the time the same. Because the husband tries to influence the wife. I don't like so and so. And you are my wife. We don't like so and so. Isn't it? Well, I'm your wife. And then the, the wife and the husband will agree together to live the same life and to have the same attitude to the people they call their enemies. And you can tell, as you match the Bible with the life of that family, you can tell whether it's a Christian family or not. Sometimes a local church. A local church, sometimes they get united. They have the same understanding. They have the same attitude. They have the same disposition. And if the pastor of that church, the leader of that church, if he has a kind of attitude and he has a kind of disposition, it comes out in the preaching. And then he can spread that kind of attitude to the whole congregation. And you can tell whether that's a Christian church or not. Because that whole church, they have a kind of attitude towards some people. And their attitude can tell you whether that church is the church of Christ or it's not the church of Christ. Sometimes in a whole denomination, a whole denomination can have an attitude that is so contrary to the kingdom life. 
And no matter where the branch is, the branch may be here in our city, in another city. Anywhere you go, you see that same lifestyle. And that same, if it's, a, let's say they have animosity against, you know, some other groups of people. You find that that whole church as a denomination, they will have that same kind of hatred against some particular individuals. And the way they talk, when you meet their members, you know them by the way they talk, not just by their dressing, their attitude. And the way they almost like fight with everybody, it's like, you know, everybody in the community is their enemy. And then they don't have the right attitude to the people they pick up as their enemy. You can tell whether that whole denomination, as a denomination, actually is following Christ or not. And as we read the word of God, just reading it without even interpretation, you can tell as you compare these words with your life, with my life, with our lives together. Whether you belong to God, whether I belong to God, whether this church as a church belongs to God, whether this whole denomination, deep and light, the whole church, whether we belong to God or not. Look at the words, Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 43, ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. All the Pharisees, that, that was what they had. And you could tell, Pharisee anywhere, any tribe, anywhere you found them, it was the principle, the whole denomination of the Pharisees lived by. Can we say about this church, Deep Alive, that we live by the principle of the word of God? Can people read the Bible and look at us and say they match? They look alike. Oh, no wonder they call them Deep Alive Bible Church. Their life matches the Bible. Or can people look at us and say, wait, see what we read. And look at this whole church. Look at the whole denomination. Look at their attitude towards people they regard as their enemies. What do people know about us? Very important. And then in verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Here is a sentence that divides the gracious people from the graceless people. Here is the verse that shows where you stand on the right hand side of the cross. On the left hand side of the cross. Here is what shows whether we have visited Calvary with any result, any effect at all. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. This will take grace. Somebody pouring curses upon you. Not just insult. Not just abuse. Not just belittling you. Not just quietly depreciating you. Not just quietly withdrawing from you. But openly, overtly. In a dynamic way, in an aggressive way, pouring curses upon you, not secretly to your face. And then you're able to stand there, and in the depths of your heart, there's no hatred, there's no malice, there's no anger. And then instead of just even being neutral, saying, I won't talk, you're not quiet. You bless. He curses. You reverse all the curses. And you say the Lord bless you. And the Lord change your heart. And the Lord do good in your life. You think it. You say it. You mean it. And you pray in a very dynamic way with faith. That the Lord will bless the fellow cursing you. That's a mark of salvation. 
You see, Jesus Christ, the way he taught, he didn't tell the people, no, you are not saved. No, you are saved. Just told them, love your enemies. And then they can tell. They can tell whether they were saved or not. They could tell whether they were children of God or not. And you can tell. I don't need to tell you you are born again or you are not born again. You can tell as we read the word. Then it says, do good to them that hate you. And these are people that do not hide their hatred. These are not imaginary people. This is not hating you in the dream. This is hating you in the daylight. And this is showing you. There's somebody you greet and says, don't greet me. Don't you know I hate you? There's somebody that shows you openly and publicly that he hates you. And then you're thinking, what good can I do for this man? Just to show that Christ lives within me. That's salvation. Anything less than this, there's no salvation. That's just religion. You know, people have religion. We have not having salvation. But it says, do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Then it says in verse 45, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ said, hey, you know the greatest title somebody can have on earth, child of God. You know the greatest testimony heaven can be about a person is a child of God. You know the greatest sin that you can carry to the grave. You not carry money to the grave. You not carry title to the grave. You not carry your certificate to the grave. You not carry position to the grave. You not carry anything to the grave. You not carry your achievement on heart to the grave. The only thing you carry to the grave that will see you through on the other side of the grave, the, the title Child of God. And Jesus said, before that time comes that you leave this world, have this one in your heart. Have this one in your spirit. Have this one in your experience that you are a child of God. And how do you know that you are a child of God? He said, you love your enemies. That you may be the child of God. Children of God. And then he says, because he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. And now the Lord is asking some questions in verse 46. For if ye love them that love you, which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? What a question. Have you heard about the people that belong to a society, a fraternity? And in that fraternity, it's all for evil. But see how they love one another. And Jesus said, if you only love the people that love you, what have you done? Even those in the fraternity, even those in secret calls, they love one another to the point of death. It says that's no sign of grace. When you love the people that love you and you greet the people that greet you, that's no sign of grace. Everybody does that, even the animals. Have you seen those animals just walking together? And they appear to love one another. They don't fight one another, even animals. But it's only when they see the other fellow as an enemy and they attack the other animal. It says, if we do the same thing and we only love the people that love us and then we attack the people that attack us, it said, we're not better than animals. And we're not better than all the other people we meet on the street that have no grace at all. And then he tells us, in asking for the question, it says, do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, if you, if you salute your denominational members only, if you, if you greet and salute only the people in your little circle only, it says, what do ye more than others? 
do not even the publicans so or the question and now you begin to turn that question in what you begin to ask yourself really who do i greet who do i not greet who do i salute who do i not salute who do i fellowship with who do i not fellowship with who do I show some kind of practical love, understanding to? Who do I withdraw my cooperation, my love from? And then as you begin to measure yourself with the word of God, you begin to see whether you are a child of God or not. That's why it's very important as we look at this, the love of God's children for their enemies. The love of God's children for their enemies. You see, as we look at the Bible, the New Testament in particular, the New Testament tells us that although God is the creator of everybody, he's not the father of everybody. Jesus Christ makes us to understand there are those who are children of God. Look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 9. Matthew chapter 5 verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers and you know, you know, not everybody in this world is a peacemaker. You know that. You know that in your community. Not everybody is a peacemaker in your community. You know that. As you know, this country is passing through election period now. You know that not everybody in our community is a peacemaker. You know that. Even those who appear to be religious, those who come to church, you know it's not everybody that's a peacemaker. Not even everybody is a peace lover. Not everybody likes when there's peace, rest, tranquility, understanding, love, fellowship. You know, some people feel inconvenient. Everything is so quiet. Everything is so peaceful. Why is nobody making trouble? Peace makes them feel inconvenient. They are not children of God. But Jesus said, there are children of God. How do you know them? They have the peace of God in their hearts. And that makes them to relate at peace with all the people. But he tells us that there are some people who are not children of God, you know. In John chapter 8. In John chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 42. Jesus said unto them, if, ye, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? If we are of the same father, we'll understand our speech, you know. If we come from the same source, we'll understand one another. Why is it you don't understand my language? I'm a child of, I'm the son of God, he said. I came from him. He sent me. I am the only begotten son of God. If you were children of God, we'll understand one another. Can't we say that here? If A is a child of God, if B is a child of God, you'll understand one another. You understand one another's speech. Why is it you don't understand? Because you are not of the same source. And so Jesus said, If I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why don't you understand my speech? Even because he cannot hear my word, now, verse 44, this is a bombshell. Nobody ever told them something like this before. You know, I love Jesus. One, because he saved me. Two, because he always told the truth. You know, it's good to tell the truth. Sometimes the truth is not very, very sweet, but you still have to tell the truth. Because, you know, when you tell the truth, they might hate you momentarily. In fact, he just told them 
that is because we're not from the same place, from the same source. That's why you don't understand. Of course, they had hatred for him. Now, can you imagine Jesus Christ facing that kind of hatred and still is going to tell them the truth? Because they needed this, and we need this, and you need this, and I need this. Somebody needs to tell us before the D day, before the final day. Somebody needs to tell you before it becomes too late whether you have God or not. And in verse 44, here is what it says Ye of your father the devil nobody ever spoke like that before from the beginning of the bible till this time nobody ever spoke to the jews or to the pharisees telling them face to face point blank because you see their works their behavior their character sold them out and he said, ye of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him when he speaketh a lie. He speaketh of his own. For he is a liar, and the father of it. And so we need to check up. As we read all this, I don't want our Bibles to look like, you know, going to lecture. You know, just going to study the Bible. Having each on our notes, in our head, and not in our heart. And then after listening to everything, we go back home and our behavior to our wives don't change. And our relationship with our husbands don't change. And our reactions, responses to our teachers in school, there is no change. And our interaction with one another in the church, there is no change. And yet we come to the Bible study. And these are practical things that ought to change our lives make us drive us to Calvary make us to pray and have something within us that we didn't have before this study will change every one of us amen. give me a good amen, amen. whatever well, they study to three parts number one scriptural perception of God's children on earth the scriptural perception of God's children on earth. Number two, script, uh, scriptural prayer of God's children for their enemies. Scriptural prayer, please understand. Almost everybody prays for their enemy. But you know, there are different kinds of prayer that people pray for their enemies. Some people pray for their enemies. That man shall fall down and die. So that I'll be free from trouble. The man is a troublemaker. The man is hurting me. It's my enemy. I'm praying for him. What prayer are you praying for? Let him fall down and die. That's not the kind of scriptural prayer. Other people pray. God should destroy his business. Destroy his work. So that he will know. That he has been touching the anointed of the Lord. That's not the kind of prayer. Scriptural prayer. Other people pray. Oh Lord. What he wished for me. Let it happen to him. He wanted me to be destroyed. Oh Lord. Show him. Destroy him. That's not the kind of prayer. Scriptural prayer. Of God's children. For the enemies. This is how we know who are children of God, who are not children of God. By the way, those of you that have that kind of prayer book, that when your enemy has done something, then you begin to open that prayer book, and then they say, This is the prayer to pray. Pray for a number of days to see the effect on them, they will suffer. And then you begin to pray. You are not a child of God. A child of God will pray. Scriptural prayer. Positive prayer. 
A prayer of progress. A prayer of change, conversion, of repentance. That this fellow, my enemy, that God will touch his heart. God will call him to himself. And God will draw him to conversion. So he will get to heaven. That's the prayer. You pray scriptural prayer for your enemy. This is how we know who are children of God. But those who say, well, I'm a child of God. I'm a member of deeper life. But you know these enemies, pastor. These people are terrible. If you know what they have done. I see them in the day. I see them in the dream. They hurt me. And so what are you going to do? I'm praying for them. What prayer are you praying? Match it with the prayer of Christ on the cross. Forgive them, Father. For they know not what they do. Point number three. Keeps scriptural provision of God's children for their enemies. Scriptural provision of God's children for their enemies. What a wonderful study is this as it shows us a very hard and shows us how to live. We're looking at number one. What's number one? I know it's a, I just want to wake you up so you don't sleep on me. In Matthew chapter one, 5, I'm reading from verse 43. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Scriptural perception of who God's children are on earth. Ye have heard that has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy, but I say unto you, if you belong to me, I say unto you. If you are one of my disciples, I say unto you. If you are going to follow me to heaven, I say unto you. If you have received of my grace, and if you count my teaching, anything important, if you know I came from God, I came to bless you, I say unto you, love your enemies. By the way, that's in the plural. How many enemies do you have? Love all of them. Some of them are almost harmless. They can only threaten. They cannot do anything. Love them. Some of them are powerful. And some of them can do things that will really upset you. Love them. Some of them can affect your business. Love them. Some of them can affect your emotion, affect your feeling. Love them. All your enemies. That's what Jesus said. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven here the lord jesus christ said we have a father in heaven and for you to show to prove to demonstrate that are one of the children of her father in heaven love your enemies by the way it is not the loving of your enemies that makes you a child of god you need to understand is telling us you love your enemy so you can resemble God, a father in heaven. You cannot tell that a child resembles the father until the child is born. You cannot look at the child before the child is born in the mother's belly and say, this child resembles the father. How would you know? The child must be born first. And then, as you look at the child, the way the child is walking, the look of the child, the voice of the child, the, the stature of the child, you say, now understand the child is born. After that, you see the child, then you say, this one is like his father. The same thing, you are born again first. And then as you are born again, you become, you're a child of God, but I don't know. I've never met you. I didn't know when you were kneeling down praying. I didn't know when you raised up your hand. I didn't know when you repented of your sin. I'm just meeting you now for the first time. But then, as I look at your behavior, and I look at your character, 
And I look at what you do to the people that throw arrows of sharp words, destructive words at you. And then you smile and say, God bless you. And then they hurt you. And you say, Lord, forgive them. They don't understand that this hurts. I pray nobody will do this kind of thing to them so they will not suffer as they make me to suffer. As I listen to you say that, I say, this one is a child of God. I wasn't there when you were born again. It is your language. It's your behavior. It's your reaction. It's your lifestyle that makes me to know that you are a child of God. That's what Jesus is saying. He said, by your love for your enemy, by your reaction to your enemy, then you will show your proof that you resemble your father who is in heaven. How then do we become children of God? Second Corinthians chapter 6. In Second Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 17. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Come out from among them. He's been talking about unbelievers and believers, about darkness and light, about uh, those who belong to Belial and those who belong to God. And he says, come out from among them. That's repentance. He calls us to repentance. And he says, as you repent of your sin, as you turn away from every evil in your heart, in your life, as you say, Lord, I know this is evil, this is bad, and I want to be a child of God. And you turn around, and then you hold on to the cross. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And now your sins are forgiven. And the power of sin is broken in your life. And the power of the bad habit is broken and destroyed. And now there's a new life, a peaceful life. A mind, a heart that rests on the finished work of Calvary. Then the testimony of the Spirit of God is in your heart. That you are now a child of God. And now your behavior is what will make your neighbors to see that this one has been with Christ. He is a child of God. Let me put it this way. Character confirms conversion character confirms conversion that means yes you are converted how do we know it's your character that will confirm it and if you are not converted it's your character that will show it your life in particular now with your enemies. You know, the, the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ is very, very practical. There's nobody in this life that doesn't interact and relate with other people. You cannot just say isolated. You might go to the market, relate with people. You might go to the office, relate with people. You might go to school, <clears throat> you relate with people. Anywhere you are, you relate with people. And your interaction with those people will tell whether you are a child of God or not. Character confirms conversion. We're looking in Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's it. You turn away from your sin, then you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith. You are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And then we're told in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 14. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14, here is the Spirit of God attesting to, testifying to that conversion. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. How does the spirit lead? In what direction does the spirit lead? Understand, Christ and the Holy Spirit are always in agreement. Always. The spirit of God will never lead you to do something contrary to what Jesus Christ has taught never the spirit of god and christ are always in agreement 
As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You find there's somebody and it's raining curses and um, whatever against over an enemy. How could you do that? Were you not at the, did you not listen to the Bible study? Oh, uh, the Spirit of God led me to do this. I didn't want to do it. The Spirit of God just rose up within me and told me to curse this man that his life will dry up, his business will dry up, that he will see something terrible, calamity in his family. I didn't want to do it. The Spirit of God led me. Never. The Spirit of God God will never lead you to do something contrary to what Christ has said. Christ and the Spirit are always the same. They're united. So you cannot do something contrary to what Jesus said and said this is the Holy Ghost. That's not the Holy Ghost. That's evil spirit. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children and the sons of God. If we are children of God, how will the Spirit lead us? He will lead us to love our enemies. He will lead us how to pray for our enemies. He will lead us how to do good to them that hate us. He'll, he'll show us how to bless them. Because the Spirit will always lead in line with what Christ has taught. And then he tells us in First John chapter 3. First John Chapter 3, verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Here is John. This John, he had been with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the spirit of Christ has come upon him. And the boldness and the courage of Christ has also come upon him. You know, other people don't speak like this. But John, the apostle of love, he had to tell the truth. It's good to tell the truth every time. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinners from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. What are the works of the devil? I know what you are thinking about, but I want to tell you, hatred is of the devil. Hatred is of the devil. I I'll read it to you now. Malice is of the devil. Anger is of the devil. Want you to curse other people is of the devil. Want you to hurt and harm other people, whether those people are enemies or not, doesn't matter. They're creatures of God. Want you to hurt or harm anybody is of the devil. And Jesus came that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For the seed, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. There are children of God and there are children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that she had from the beginning. That we should love one another. He said this message does not change. From country to country, love one another. From generation to generation, love one another. And it doesn't matter whether you're a little child or just a teenager or you are an adult, whether you are single or you are married, whether you have children, not children, the message cuts across the whole section of, of all society. Love one another. He said, this is what you heard from the beginning and it has not changed. That no matter where you find yourself, and no matter in what society you might find yourself, and no matter those people among which, among the people you dwell, and they are aggressive people, warlike people, violent people, don't allow their aggressiveness to change the fact that you are a child of God. 
a children of the devil behave as children of the devil, then children of God will behave as children of God. And this is the message that we heard from the very beginning. Love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil, wicked one. Didn't I tell you? And slew his brother. Hatred is of the devil. Malice is of the devil. That anger that wants to hurt another person, even to hurt your enemy, that's of the devil. And wherefore slew he him because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you, ye know that we are passed from death unto life. How do we know that? Because we love the brethren, because we love, because we love, because we love. You know, you call somebody, you say, um, do you go to us fellowship? No. Were you going before? Ah, I was going before. You know, in our fellowship those days, you'll find me almost as number one. Every time. And then I'll clean all the chairs. Put every, I, I did it with joy. Why don't you go to your house fellowship anymore? It's a long story. Some of those people there, if I begin to tell you what he did to me, how they hurt me, and the slander, and the lies they told against me, I don't go anymore. I don't want to go anymore. Please go back there. No, I can't go back there. If it becomes compulsory to go to us for worship, I'll leave the church. Why? They hate me, I hate them. You know. And this is what shows whether we're children of God or not. That kind of hatred, that kind of malice, that kind of sexual anger that will not go even if our leaders come to visit you and you know you see that coordinator that you know almost even though he's a man he knelt down and said please please my brother don't forget it forget it and even though you saw this man older than you are your coordinator your pastor your leader kneeling down before you say please get up no matter what anybody does, I've made up my mind. The hatred is so settled and the hatred is, is permanent. I cannot talk to that person anymore. You're not a child of God then. The brother is kneeling down before you just to tell you to repent. It's not that if you are not in the house fellowship that everything will collapse. We just, we love you. We don't want you to go to hell after, you know, attending all these Bible studies. That's why we're pleading love one another. Because it is this that shows that you are really a child of God. Don't be like Cain, who was of the wicked one. And then it says... In verse 14, I read it again. We know that we are passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother, help me finish it, abideth in death. The way we should read that, if I love not my brother, I abide in death. If you don't love your wife, you know, we're even talking about your brother now. If you don't love your wife, how can you love your enemy? The mother of your children. If you don't love the mother of your children, who has suffered for you and suffered with you, how can you love the enemy? If you don't love your husband, how can you love your enemy? The man is paying house rent. The man, you're using the name of the man. And you have quite a lot of benefits from the man. And if you cannot love this man, your husband, how can you love your enemy? What are we talking about? If you cannot love your children, 
a father, a mother. The child has done something. Mother, take your child away from here. I don't want to see this child in this house. And the mother kneels down. Daddy, don't do like this. This child, we were children before. Please, because of me, put it on me. Get away from my side. I say I don't want to see this child in this house anymore. If you don't love your child, how can you love your enemy? Here we are, members of the same church, believing the same doctrine. And if you cannot love the person that believes the same doctrine with you, how can you love your enemy, the one that is even restrained by the teaching in the church that is very careful, he will not curse you, he will not, you know, persecute you, he's very careful because maybe he's a worker, he doesn't want the leaders to hear anything bad about him so they don't take the work of God away from his son, he's very careful and yet... You cannot love him. If you don't love somebody, a member of the church here like yourself, how can you love your enemy? Let's stop deceiving one another. This is the proof that we're children of God or we're not children of God. And it says, let us not love in tongue only, but in deed. I pray God will help us. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Point number two, scriptural prayer. Wonderful. This is very important. Scriptural prayer of God's children for their enemies. Scriptural prayer. Scriptural prayer. Scriptural prayer. You can measure whether you are growing or you are not growing by the kind of prayer you pray. I'm going to ask you, 15 years ago, you had enemies. How did you pray for your enemies 15 years ago? Think about that. 10 years ago, 5 years after, how did you pray for your enemies? If the way you prayed for your enemies 5 years after is different, from the way you prayed for your enemies much, much earlier in your Christian life, something is changing. Now today, 15 years after, how do you pray for your enemies today? How did you pray 15 years ago? How did you act 15 years ago when somebody did not love you, persecuted you? Oh, Sunday morning you went to him, you knocked at the door. I just came to say I'm going to church. Will you go with me with a smile? And you know it's your enemy. 15 years ago, that's how you acted. And you prayed Saturday night. Oh Lord, touch the heart of this woman. Touch the heart of this man. I'm going, I'm going to invite him to church tomorrow morning. He's been grinding something with me. I want him to hear the word of God. He needs life eternal. 15 years ago, that's how you acted to your enemies. But today... How do you act to your enemies? How do you pray for your enemies today? What's the language in your mouth today towards your enemy? Things have changed with you. You are not progressing. You are backsliding. If you are not cursing your enemy. If we are making progress. If we prayed for our enemies 15 years ago, if we're making progress today, we'll pray a greater prayer, a more effective prayer, a prayer of love, a prayer of change, a prayer of conversion for our enemies. You know, as you grow in life, you can tell there were things you could endure 15 years ago that if anybody did it, you just pass by, you say, that fellow is immature. Why is he acting like that? You laugh it off. Today, the things you laughed off, you smiled off 15 years ago. How do you react to that same thing today? Today, it bothers you. And you make everybody an enemy today. 
Is that progress sincerely? As you look at your life, would you say you are making progress or you are backsliding? But the Lord wants us to recover ourselves and to come back. And to see that if those things did not hurt us 20 years ago, 15 years ago, they shouldn't hurt us now. The love of 15 years ago, 20 years should still be there today. It's still the same Christ, the same grace, the same power, the same promise of God, the same abundant eternal life. There should be a change that will be able to say, now I want to grow. Grow in love towards my enemies as days go by. I'll pray for my enemies. In Luke chapter 23, pray for your enemies. Luke chapter 23. We're looking at verse 34. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. I want you to understand at this time, Jesus was having a crown of thorns on his head. I want to remind you at this time, the blood was still dripping down. I want to remind you at this time, the nails were still in his hand and his feet. I want to remind you at this time, they were jeering at him. They were mocking him. If he be the Christ, let him come down from the cross. In the midst of all that agony, he said, Father, if you were, the pains are still there. The mark of the nail is still there. You are getting weaker and weaker because you are losing blood. And the people are around you. And you say, I'm thirsty. And instead of helping you to minimize the pain, they want to give you something bitter like gall to drink. And in the midst of all that, you want to pray for them. There are whole churches today, the kind of prayer they will pray, God, see what they are doing. Show them that I mighty God, that I will not suffer like this. In vain, show them. Then you reveal you are not of Christ. Whole denominations pray like that to destroy their enemies. And sometimes, what are we fighting on? Land. I bought land. That man is fighting with me to get the land. And then you will not eat. You are fasting and praying that God will do something negative. Land. You want the fellow to die and go to hell because of land. Sometimes it's because of job. Sometimes your child has gone to school and your child came back and said that they didn't give me the right mark because they wanted me to commit sin with them. And I said no. And because of that, the teacher has failed me. And then the parents will take that and say that teacher is an enemy to this family. And they begin to fast and pray. Christianity. This whole thing, we're joining this tradition. The black man, or the black heart, although we carry the Bible, but we're not following the message of Christ that says you pray for your enemies. Christ hanging on the cross with all the agony and the pain. And yet he said, Father, forgive them. That's the prayer. Scriptural prayer of God's children for their enemies. If you are not able to do that, don't deceive yourself. Thank God you have not died yet. If you died in that enmity in your heart, how will you get to heaven? But if you can today be sincere and then come back to the fruit of the cross and say, Lord, I lost something. In all these activities of life, up and down, I've lost something. 
looks like I don't have the gentleness and the love and the, and the affection that I used to have. Get back to the cross and let the Lord forgive you and then implant that love again in your heart and then you'll be able to pray like Jesus prayed for his enemies. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Even after the prayer, they still did more evil. Think about that. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7. Acts, chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 51. You stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Do ye, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did so do ye? Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And you have slain them that showed before the coming of the just one of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Now understand, look at this Stephen, talking like this, you think oh, the man doesn't have love. No, you see there is something, there's a difference between preaching and then personal interaction. He was preaching. He was standing as a messenger of the Lord to tell them what their lives were. And he said, your stiff neck in heart and ear. Now, you see, that's just telling the truth. You know, you cannot judge a man by, by his preaching. He might preach about hell. You cannot judge him that he doesn't have love just because he's preaching on hell. He might say that sinners are going to hell. You cannot say the man is not a Christian. He doesn't have love because he's talking about hell for sinners. He might say that you're stiff necked, you're hardened, and it appears that you are not really living the way you ought to live. You cannot condemn the man because he's saying that that's preaching the truth. And we have to preach the word in season and out of season. But you know, you'll see his love now, you see his prayer. You make a difference between the ministry and the man in his personal interaction with people. You know, as a prayer cannot become so soft like a jellyfish, you cannot tell the truth. And all you say now is, you know, sinners and believers, God bless every one of you. We're all going to heaven because I'm trying to love. That's not love, that's deception. That's false doctrine. But here you now see, as we look at that Acts chapter 7, and then you see the reaction of the people. And then we're told in verse 54, when they had had these things, they were caught to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their tears. And he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said behold I see the heavens opened you can tell he didn't have any animosity or hatred in the heart he knew they hated him he could see it on their faces and yet he said I see something can I tell you I have revelation can I show you I see the heavens opened this was a spiritual man and then he said, I saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet. Whose name was Saul. And the stone Stephen. Stop there for a moment. Have you gone through something like that? No. Stones are heavier than words. What if some people throw words at you? Words of slander. 
Words of abuse. Words of insult. They throw it at you. That's not stone. If somebody throws stone at you and hits your forehead, if I wasn't there, if you came, I'll see it on your forehead. I'll say, brother, what happened to your forehead? I'll see that. If somebody threw a word at you, a word of slander, somewhere there, and I wasn't there, and then you come out of there, and you have a smile, and you go your way, I will not know that anybody threw anything at you because you're matured. You overcome that. You overlook that. You go your way. But in this case, this is Stephen. And they were throwing stones at him. If you were, what will you do? What do people throw at you that make you so angry? And it looks we should pull the whole roof of the church down. Let everything collapse. Scatter the whole church. What did they throw at you? That brings this kind of tempestuous thing. Look at Stephen. Having salvation. The same salvation we have. Having sanctification, the same sanctification coming from Christ. And having the Holy Ghost, the same Holy Ghost that is promised to us. What have they thrown at you that makes you all angry? And the stone stealing, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin against their charge. What a prayer. What a prayer. That's a prayer to pray. Let's remain a Bible church. Let's remain on this word of God. Don't let persecution change the grace of God in your life. Don't let pain change the glory of God in our lives the love of God in our families whatever those things are the evil report the curse they wish us evil they show hatred in their attitude and action or they despise us they insult us they attempt to hurt or harm us don't allow that to change you let the grace remain and let the love of God remain. God will do it. Point number three. Scriptural provision of God's children for their enemies. Now provision, provision. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 44. Matthew chapter 5 verse 44. Love your enemies. You know, if it was a long sentence, you might say, I've forgotten, I've forgotten. That when the situation arose, I just didn't know what to do. So simple, three words, love your enemies. Carry that with you everywhere you go. When you go to the market, and that other woman is, you know, trying to get all your customers, love your enemies. When you go to the office and that other fellow is trying to stand against your promotion, love your enemies. When you interact with people in your place where you live and that other fellow is making life inconvenient for you, love your enemies. They will not pay for the light in the house and then they put everything on me. Love your enemies. The mother-in-law, she's coming again. And every time she comes, I wonder why this woman will not stay in the village and stay where she is. Love your enemies. These brothers of my husband, you know, I'm just like a slave here. I have to cook for this and cook for that. And they don't have any good work to say. No, thank you. All the food I cook for these brothers of my and sisters of my husband, is, everything is negative. I suffer for it. Love your enemies enemies and the people we had business together i thought he was a brother 
And I put all my capital into this thing. And now everything is gone. Nothing remaining. And it's failure. And he's still coming to church. I cannot even see it on the same bench with him. Is that so? Love your enemies. You see, these three words, they show us where we are spiritually. Where our heart is. What our experiences are. Whether we have Christ within or not. And now he says, we even need to make some provisions for them. We pray for them. That's not enough. We even need to do some things now very positive, contributing to their lives. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Do good. Don't do evil. Ask yourself, what I'm, do, what I'm going to do to him? Will he love it? Will he enjoy it? That's doing good. Will it benefit his life? That's doing good. Will it make him happy? That's doing good. I'm going to surprise him. I'm going to surprise him. That of all those things he's done against me, I'm going to pleasantly surprise him and do something good for him. That's doing good. When you surprise people pleasantly, they have hurt you. They're even afraid now. You will use your power. You'll use your position. You'll use your authority. You use your privilege. You're, you're going to use everything you've got to get at them. They're afraid. They say, uh -huh, I've gone too far. I touched so and so. I did so, such and such. Uh -huh. I'm going to suffer. Are you a Christian? And now you do good and you surprise them. That's Christianity. That's what Jesus said. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That she may be the children of your father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. That's what the Lord is saying. We will do it. I said we will do it. Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12. Verse 20 and verse 21. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. I don't just, I'm, I'm sure you've read that before, but you need to ask yourself now. If you put a hundred Christians, now you line them up and you read this verse and you ask them in the past year, did you ever see your enemy get hungry? Yes, I saw them get hungry. What was your attitude between you and I? I will tell you. They will say, I was very happy when he was hungry. You know, when he is hungry, he will be weak. When he is weak, he will not be able to have energy to fight me again. And so I thank God that the fellow is even hungry and weak now. And now he cannot do the hurt he used to do. He's sick. He has lost his job. He doesn't have any way with that to pay house rent. My enemy, what am I going to do? If you're a Christian, strengthen him. Get him off from that sickness. Pray for him. Lay your hands on him to get well. And if he doesn't have any money in the pocket, give him something. Don't allow the man to die in his sin. It says, if your enemy... If he hungers, he says, this is what you have to do. That you feed him. Not to a bad food. Not to a food that is going rotting. Good food. Feed him. And then it says, if he thirsts, give him drink. Give him. Not with the left hand. No, just throw it at him. Just give him respectfully. Give him with love. Give him that he would like to drink it. Give him, he'll be surprised. The way you give him, your attitude. The thing you give and the way you give it, let it surprise him. He was expecting that you will retaliate. But now grace has multiplied in your life. And then you give him 
the dream for his so doing. Thou shall heap coals of fire on his head. That just means he'll have a burning conviction. What he has done against you will be more pronounced in his life. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with what? With good. Thank God we will do it. The Lord is telling us something. He's saying his grace can come into our lives and change us so thoroughly and so completely that the way we were will not be like that anymore. We're going out of this place tonight. And all of us who have had this Bible study in all those various locations, you're going out of that place, you're going with love. You're going with grace. You're going with the compassion of Christ in your heart. You're thinking about them now. Who are the people? Think about, picture them now in your mind. When you get back home, aha, uh -huh, it's so and so. You remember him? It's always, whenever time you come back from Bible study, it's always sitting on that side, sit on the chair, and then it's ready for you. It's ready for a fight again. Every time you come after the Bible study, it's the one that spoils the whole thing. You know, you've got great things on the Bible study, then you get back home, and guess the first man you see, it is the same man, is sitting in that same place, having the same look, having the same disposition, and is going to say exactly the same words he used to say. Picture him now in your mind, picture her in your mind. And then what are you going to do when you get back to him? Practice the smile and practice the things you will say, that now I'm full of the love of God. Say that, I'm full of the love of God. I'm full of the grace of God. Christ lives on the inside of me. Say it again. When I get back home, I will show that love. Rise up and tell the Lord. That's what the Lord wants us to do. That's what he wants us to do. Go back home and show that love. To that man, to that woman, show that love. Don't carry the hatred they carry. You are different. Don't carry the malice they carry. You are different. Don't let them pull you down to their level. You have the grace of God. You have Christ living within you. You are a child of God. Don't allow their frown, their hatred, their malice to pull you down to their level. They have not listened to the Bible study. They have not heard the word of God. They have not given their heart to Jesus. You are the one that you have given your life to Jesus. And he is living in you. Show that you are different. Whatever they do, love them. Whatever they say, love them. However they act, love them. Loving them may not change them in one night. Keep on loving them. Loving them may not change them in one week. Keep on loving them. Loving them may not even change them in one month. Keep on loving them. If their hatred multiplies, let your love multiply. If their malice increases, let your love increase. If the opposition increases, let your prayer increase for them. Love them. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. The people that try to hurt you. The people that try to harm you. Think about it now. What help are you going to render to them? What assistance are you going to give them? What gift are you going to give them? Have you taken your mother for an enemy? 
Have you taken your father for an enemy? What good are you going to do to mommy? What good are you going to do to daddy? The things they have said. You remember what mommy did? Cursing you. Insulting you. Saying you will never marry. You're a bad child. Because you are born again. And because of that, you don't even talk to mommy anymore. Love her. What good are you going to do? To the people that are hurting your life. What are you planning? Develop a strategy. A strategy of doing good. A strategy of helping. Don't develop a strategy of ruining them, destroying them, blackmailing them, cutting them down, making them to lose some valuable things. Don't do that. Make a plan. Make a plan. That man hurting me, that man hindering me, that man wanting to harm me. I have a plan. I'm going to give him a pleasant surprise. I would love him. Carry a smile, not a frown. Carry love, not hatred. This is what shows who a Christian is and who an unbeliever is. Love. And if you are to love your enemy like this, how about your friends? This is great. This is great. If you are to love your enemies like this, how about your friends? Loving your friends. Loving the people that help you. Loving the people that have great benefit to you. If you are to love your enemies, how about loving the brethren? Think about that. If we are to so love our enemies in practical ways, how about loving the brothers and the sisters in the church? And even brothers and sisters outside our church. If we only love our members, what good, what more have we done? What have we done more than other churches? They love one another too. They love their members too. But when you love them, whether they're in our church or not in our church, they oppose us, love them, contradict us, love them. They criticize, criticize you and criticize your church. Love them. Love the brethren. If we are to love our enemies, how about loving your husband? If you cannot love your enemy, how can you love your wife? How can you love your husband? If you cannot love the people that hurt you, how can you love the people that help you? Or if you cannot love the people so close to you, husband and wife, how can you love the people that are far away from you, criticizing and oppressing you and hurting your life? Let there be love. Let your imagination be full of love. Let your thoughts be full of love. Let your plans be full of love. The things you are thinking of doing, your thoughts. Don't allow hatred in the thought. If there's hatred in the thought, there will be hatred in the action. It's when there's love in your thought. Then that love will come to your action. Love in your plan. 
Love your in your, your imagination. Love in your discussion when you talk about somebody. Don't talk hatred. Don't repeat the things they did to hurt you. The more you repeat it, the more it will be painful to you. Swallow it. Forget it. Talk love. Love one another. What makes a good church? A good, a good church teaches good doctrine. A good church practices good doctrine. What makes a good Christian? A good Christian hears the good words of the Lord. A good Christian practices. The good word of the Lord. Make up your mind when you get back home, when you get back to the office, in a very practical way to show this love of Christ. Love your enemies.